Hello and welcome to Inside the Synod. I'm Sebastian Gomes. The work of the small language groups, the Chircoli Minori, continued today. They are discussing the first part of the Instrumentum Laboris on the context of the family today and the overarching challenges that they face. Now, we had an opportunity to speak to a few more of the Synod Fathers and delegates from inside the Synod of Bishops today. Here now are a few more of those interviews. Well, Sebastian, what I'm really thinking is that I have a lot to learn. I've come here to uh, listen as the Holy Father asked us to with um, an open heart, a humble heart, but also to have a heart that's courageous to speak. So I'm just trying to balance those two right now as we uh, begin the process. One thing that we need to tell the families out there that we are well aware as pastors, as bishops, that there are families who are committed to live out their family commitments. And to them want to say, keep up the good work. You are on the right track and you are an encouragement to us. These are the witnesses that we need for today. I think we should uh, show our charism of mercy to those who were alienated from the divine grace for, for several decades or, or several years. I have a hope that the church could be more open towards those who are eliminated from the church communion. On days like today when there are no general congregation meetings, the Holy See Press Office will bring a few of the Synod Fathers to the press briefing. Uh, and today was present Archbishop Charles Palmer Buckle, who's from Ghana, and he gave this very informative introduction about the church in Africa and the presence of the African bishops here at the Synod. I'm here on behalf of the continent of Africa, and it's about the continent that is fastest growing in the Catholic Church at present. Um, we are made up of... Uh, eight regional conferences. We are together all in all about 37 different Episcopal conferences that form what we call the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences of Africa and Madagascar. Very um, complex. We normally, when we meet, we speak three official languages, but in reality, there are four because you have the Serna, where they use Arabic. Then you have the, what we call Rekua, that's the um, Regional Episcopal Conference of West Africa, where we speak both English and French. And then you have uh, Imbiza, where some of the countries speak Portuguese and the others speak English and then you have Southern Africa. So this is just to give you a little bit the complexity of uh, the continent. Ignatius Joseph III Unin, who's the Patriarch of Antioch and the Syriac Catholic Church, was also at the press briefing, and he shared his perspective and the perspective of his local church in the Middle East. I am happy to know that Monseigneur l'évêque Charles parle of Africa where la chrétienté est en croissance, tandis que chez nous, au Moyen-Orient, c'est plutôt en diminution. Et vous savez très, très bien pourquoi. Nous sommes vraiment inquiets, même alarmés, pour la situation de nos communautés chrétiennes au Proche et au Moyen-Orient, et surtout pour cette épreuve catastrophique pour nos familles qui sont déchirées, divisées et qui font de tout, font leur possible pour sortir de l'enfer, particulièrement celui de l'Irak et de la Syrie. Yesterday, we showed you a clip from an interview that we did with Cindy Wooden, who is the Rome Bureau Chief of Catholic News Service. She spoke to me about the Synod and also the Pope's recent visit to the United States of America. As promised, here's the rest of that interview. Cindy Wooden, thanks for joining us. We're here covering the Synod of Bishops. There's so many different stories to tell. Incredible things are happening. Uh, I'm wondering, you as a journalist covering it, seeing it all up close, has anything surprised you in the first few days? Not really. I mean, I have covered synods since 1989. And the thing is, I would be surprised if there are things 
there were things that weren't surprising. You get bishops from all over the world, 270 bishops, and they each have, they bring their pastoral experience, they bring their own histories, they bring their own expertise in a variety of different fields. And so you get a whole lot of everything. And um, I think that's the point where we're at. This is only really the third day of the Synod. And I think I would be more surprised if there were some real theme emerging. And right now I think it's just about talking to one another, getting to know one another, um, and hopefully, praying and trying to feel the movement of the Holy Spirit. Do you think, because this is a, a, a synod that's picking up on last year's synod, obviously, uh, Pope Francis created this two-stage process because he sees the value in journeying together over uh, an extended period of time, but do you see the impact of that first synod already having an, an impact on this one? It's a question that I'm still asking myself, and, and in fact, that if I had a chance to speak with Pope Francis one-on-one, -on -one, my first question would be to ask him if the two synods and the year in between is working the way he hoped it would. Because he talked about a period, a year for study and discernment. Right. And I think in some ways it's been a year for positions to harden and for groups to form and petitions are being sent around, and books are being written. And, I mean, he's a smart person. He dealt with a big church in Buenos Aires. So I know that he expected all of that to happen, and maybe that's part of kind of the ferment that we need, the bubbling up, and, and it's up to the bishops who are pastors to, take seriously their responsibility to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's up to us to pray for them so that they can see from what bubbles up, what fits most closely with the church and the vision, you know, what Jesus wants from his church, right. but also the needs of the modern world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. Let's move now to Pope Francis's recent trip to the United States. It was, it was incredible to see him meeting the American people for the first time, some wonderful celebrations, some wonderful moments of encounter, and you were there, you covered the whole thing. Uh, were you surprised by anything on that trip considering uh, the narrative going into it, that there were some questions about how he was going to be received because he had never been to America. He had been very critical of, you know, a capitalist system that the United States sort of embodies in the world. Uh, were you surprised by anything that you saw? I've been watching Pope Francis almost every day since March 13th, 2013. Um, it didn't surprise me how he was received in the United States because he goes to meet people and he loves people and he's energized by people and people love him because of that. And one thing that I just kept thinking throughout this trip, what must it be like to be 78 years old and visiting the United States for the first time? And not only that, <laughs> your first trip to the United States and you're welcome to the White House, you address a joint meeting of Congress, you get flown in a helicopter around the Statue of Liberty. I mean... You're also coming from Cuba right after the rapprochement, you know, between the two countries. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think everything was set for it to be an amazing trip, and it was. Was there a moment on that trip that really jumps out to you as like a real moment of Pope Francis of encounter with, with someone or with a group of people? Well, I was actually present in the prison in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. And that was so touching because, I mean, everything was very well planned, very well controlled. Um, the prisoners were led in in very strict lines and, you know, they sat down and they were very still and they weren't allowed to speak to us and we weren't allowed to speak to them. But the Pope was ahead of schedule. And all of a sudden, he comes out from behind this blue curtain, and he goes up and he looks at the chair that they made for him. And he's like looking at the prisoners who made the chair and looking at the chair and gives them a big thumbs up. And it was just, 
in, in the formality of that setting and the way everything was so controlled, he wasn't. Yeah. He was still interacting with real people in front of him who made him a gift. And he was showing his appreciation for it in just a very casual kind of way. The second kind of amazing moment for me was Saturday night at the World Meeting of Families. I mean, he's there and right. he was listening, um, but I didn't expect him to kind of let loose <laughs> the way he did and speak from the heart. He was, uh, he was funny, he was touching, he was full of faith, he was full of hope, and he was full of joy, which I think is something that he's really been trying, and a lot of the Synod members have been trying to bring to this Synod as well. Yeah, it was certainly uh, one of the moments of Pope Francis at his best, as we, as we know him when he goes off the cuff like that. Now I have to ask you, uh, shifting gears a little bit, but, but there was a story that developed at the end of this trip uh, with a woman named Kim Davis, uh, who was a clerk in Kentucky, and she was jailed for a few days because after the uh, decision of the Supreme Court in the United States to legalize same-sex marriage. She refused a license uh, to a couple and so was disciplined for that. Um, and she was given the opportunity to meet Pope Francis and this became the huge story because Pope Francis said, uh, you know, be strong and this was interpreted as, as the Pope's sort of categorical approval of what Kim Davis stands for uh, in, in, in her struggle. Um, what did you make of the, uh, how, the, how that story just kind of exploded and took over the whole narrative of the Pope's trip? I think it was really unfortunate that it got so much attention. It was like the Pope had been back in the, uh, Rome about 24 hours, I think, when, when the story broke. And so things were starting to calm down as far as papal coverage went. Um, but I do think that a delay in reacting to it on the part of the Vatican allowed it to grow and grow and grow and grow. And they didn't make a statement, I think, for four days, something, something like that. Something so there like was that, that period when... Right. And so before the Vatican came out and said, you know, this was a brief meeting, it wasn't in any way support of everything she stands for, in those few days, the only voice we heard was the voice of her lawyer. And, I mean, that's not really fair. We had one side of the story. And the, her lawyers claim it was a 15-minute meeting. The Vatican says it was much shorter than that. But, you know, the Pope was there, was in the United States from September 22nd to the 27th. We're talking about 15 minutes of time maximum. Right. And that's going to become the story? I just, I thought it was really unfortunate. Right. That's all for today, but please join us again tomorrow for another episode of Inside the Synod. The general congregations are back in session, and that means that we'll hear about what was discussed these past few days in the small language groups, 13 of them in all. So be sure to stay tuned for that. For Salt and Light Television, I'm Sebastian Gomes in Rome.